Does it sound okay? Yes. Yes. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is not only a full genius or not, and all of this is work I've been doing with Pat Gilmer over the past year or so. Um, very quickly, just to recall what the most important thing is, I want to present the usual four genius of the knot in this way as the minimum number, <laughs> the smallest connected sum of tori that the knots found in the four ball. With that, I can state the problem and, and the definition of the non-oriental four genus. The question is, if you have a knot in the three sphere, what's the simplest non-oriental surface that it found in B4? And here I'll define the non-orientable genus as the minimum connected sum of projective planes that the knot found in the four ball. Um, the definition isn't consistent. There, there's not a lot of literature on this, but definition isn't consistent. And it, um, I think the way I've defined it, if the knot bounds a disk in the four ball, the non-oriental genus is zero. But, but other than that, definitions are consistent. Uh, here's just one example to illustrate what's, what the problem is about. You take, here I drew the 2-5 torus knot, and on the left you see that knot bounding a Mobius band. On the right is a surface bounded by the knot that's orientable, and the surface on the right in this case has uh, genus 2, and it does turn out that the smallest genus you can bound in the four ball, that not bounds in the four ball, is genus two. Uh, but obviously it bounds a Mobius band. So the general question is, just to study this, the distinction between the smooth and the oriental. And one other little example, a kind of baby theorem about the subject, just to give a little feeling of it, is that the non-orientable genus of a knot will be less than twice the orientable genus plus one. And that's simply because a projective plane embeds in four space. And so if you have an orientable surface that a knot bounds, you can build a non-orientable surface by just adding on a projective plane. So you get this inequality. The, the reason I got into looking at this well, one of the reasons was, um, for what many of you know, I've been tabulating lots of knot invariants. And there's been lots of progress with the four genus. Um, and just one example is that for, if you look through the table of knots, if you go through 10 crossing, the four genus is completely resolved now. And even beyond that, there's just lots of improvements in what we know about the four genus. But in the non-orientable setting, basically, um, only the simplest examples were known. You know, I wrote it down that there were 14. All I could kind of find was 14, and with a little more work, um, extended a little bit. But, so one was one motivation was that. The other motivation, once I looked at it a little, was just discovering how little was known. And what was really striking was that in fact, the only obstruction I could find to bounding non-orientable surfaces was an obstruction to bounding Mobius bands. And I'll come back to that. I'll give some history of that. But, and so initially, with that work, there was a question, is every knot bound a punctured Klein bottle in the four ball? And obviously, it just can't be true. But I couldn't find a way at first to, to deal with that. And it's just... It was troublesome. When you look beyond that, so, so certainly I expected that to be um, false, that there, there would be not something about fine bottles. Earlier, there was the um, observation that the four genus, not oriented four genus, was less than this plus one, but we know nothing about a stronger inequality. And then finally, what attracted me to it was just, it turns out to be closely related to lots of other problems. Um, I put up two here. 
if you look at two bridge knots, the question right away, as you, as you study the problem, turns into questions about uh, lens spaces and what four manifolds the lens spaces bound. And this is certainly an area of lots of research now. And I wanted to mention one other result. It connected to works of Owens and Strelay using Hager floor methods to study the, just the orientable four genus of knots and unknotting numbers. Um, they made lots of progress on this, very interesting results. But um, their, their exact results didn't apply in the non-orientable setting, but many of the techniques overlapped, and it was kind of partly a route for me to understand that work better. So let me give a summary of the results and an outline of talk. As I'll mention, new results advances in proving that the four genus is greater than or equal to two. That's just new ways to prove that knots don't bound Mobius bands. Also now techniques to show that knots don't bound fine bottles. We'll have some progress. It's not quite complete, and you'll see how proving that the four genus can act, non-orientable four genus can go to infinity. I want to look at a little bit about the distinction between working the topological category and the smooth category, <coughs> which is fairly standard in this subject. So the outline, I'm going to talk about really four techniques. In, in some sense, this talk is just a survey of techniques that can be applied to this problem. The first technique is looking at linking forms of three manifolds. The next is looking at signatures and R from variants of knots. The next I'll look at some smooth invariants arising from Hager floor homology, see how those can provide obstructions and better understanding. And I'm going to finish with Cass and Gordon theory that applies in the topological setting. But I should give a little background on the orientable four genus. I think most of you know this. The very first, well, I guess the first obstruction concerning the four genus was around 1961. Fox and Milner proved that if a knot has four genus zero, then its Alexander polynomial vanishes. This polynomial condition, for many reasons, doesn't extend to any higher genus problem. The first kind of general result on the four genus was work of Mirosugi, showing that the signature bounds the four genus. And I just want to point out, this already shows kind of the issues that start coming up when you move to a non-orientable setting, in that the example we had before of the just the two-end torus knot, um, the signature goes to infinity as you take more and more twists but they all bound Mobius bands. So there's not going to be any kind of signature invariant that obstructs. The next result concerning this was, um, and this is Levine Tristram introduced P signatures of knots to study the four genus. And uh, Luke Kaufman and Taylor, Bolivero, related these P signatures and also the general signature to four manifolds there. And Lou was saying someone else deserves credit as well. I'm sorry. This morning you said someone else I should have added to that no, list. I think uh, Capel and Shannison also. Okay, Capel and Shannison. Um, so that introduced general four manifold techniques into the study of four genus of knots. This can't be of any use in studying non orientable genus, in that if you take the four ball, and remove a surface, a non-orientable surface from the four ball. H1 of the complement is Z2, cyclic group of order two. So you aren't going to have higher fold covers. And that takes us back to the polynomial. Anything based on infinite cyclic covers also fails when you're looking at non-orientable surfaces. Um, one mystery result for me that I just learned about was that Andrews, in about 1963, 
use the linking form of three manifolds to obstruct being sliced, having 14 is zero. It's unpublished, and the, it's referred to by others in various ways, so I don't know the exact statement of the result. It's, uh, but in any case, and the linking form provided the first method to understand the non-orientable genus. Uh, Oleg proved that you can use the four, um, the linking form does obstruct not bounding Mobius bands. And in that announcement, he described the figure eight knot. It was frustrated up to that point. It wasn't known if the figure eight knot bounded a Mobius band or not. And so his one example was the figure eight knot. The techniques apply more generally. Set up notation. I'm going to have a knot. The knots will always be in the three sphere. I'm going to look at the M will be the twofold cover of the three sphere over a knot, and I'll use W to indicate four manifolds, branch covers, and four ball for non orientable surfaces. And a background theorem that if you have a non orientable surface and you take the twofold branch cover of the four ball over that surface, the first uh, Betty number is zero, and the second Betty number is equal to the first Betty number of the surface. This result, in the case F is orientable, is fairly standard for uh, in knot theory. You usually prove it somehow calling on the infinite cyclic cover. But uh, Massey was the first to observe that in the non-orientable setting there was a way around that. The, Second Betty number follows from an Euler characteristic argument. And as far as I can tell, if you aren't in the smooth setting, if you're just topological, you have to call on Friedman Quinn to get that result. And so finally, the first result that feeds into understanding the four genus, the term that Pat Gilmer proved in 1982, the fact is, uh, it's really a consequence of his work. He was just studying the orientable four genus, the standard four genus, but the argument applies in the setting as well. So we went back and looked at it and saw it went through. That if you bound a surface of non-orientable genus H in the four ball, then the homology of the three manifold, the two-fold branch cover, splits into the direct sum of two groups. The G1 has the property that it's presented by, it and its linking form is presented by a matrix that's H by H. That is, G1 is just three groups mod by A times F, and the linking form on the three manifold is presented by A inverse. The other part of the uh, homology of the twofold cover, G2, is metabolic meaning that there's a subgroup in that group on which the linking form vanishes, that it's perpendicular to itself with respect to the linking form. So you have a large subgroup. So this is just a restatement of the corollary I have there. It, again, the group splits and the directs on in this way. And this might be, if you haven't worked with intersect linking forms, rash two mod z value linking form. This is a little odd looking, so I wanted to do a couple of examples, just algebraic examples. The first is cyclic group, just order seven. The linking form where the generator of the z7 has self-linking five sevenths in q mod z. And the observation is that that is presented by a one by one matrix, even though the linking form so is at 5 in the numerator. It's clear that Z7 is the quotient of Z by minus 7. That's easy. But the linking form, if you take the linking form 5 sevenths, then if you take 2 in Z7, the self-linking of 2 is 5 times 2 squared, which is minus 1 7 mod Z. And so there you see it as minus one-seventh is the inverse of this matrix. 
from doing this work, there's lots of work to be done understanding the equivalence of quadratic forms. The second example of the sort of things that come up is I took the linking form on the z3 cubed, which is a direct sum of the single linking form. So generators, each of self-linking, one-third, and orthogonal. For this form, the observation is this form is isometric to the form where you have a minus a third, a minus a third, and a third. And I wrote down a basis there. So with respect to this basis of Z3, the linking form looks like this. And now, written this way, you see this is metabolic. There's elements of self-linking zero. This one one has self-linking zero. And so it splits. It does satisfy this splitting where I've split off a metabolic piece and a piece that has a one-by-one -one presentation. So again, this is an issue that comes up when you're working with such forms. And depending on the forms, there's more and more algebra that one needs to do. That sort of corollary again. So, basic examples that arise from this. The first, the figure eight knot, which Oleg observed in 1975. It was rediscovered. In the, actually, the figure eight map was also done by just Yasahara using other means in 1996, and then again using linking forms in 2000. It's hard reading the literature because you read papers, and each paper has the figure eight map as the example. But in any case, the linking form, if you take the twofold cover of the figure eight map, the linking form is two fifths. And that's not the inverse of a matrix that's one by one with determinant five. And there's no change of basis in Z5 that turns that into either plus or minus a fifth. That's figure eight knot. Another example is the granny knot. It's twofold cover, the trefoil plus itself. It's twofold cover as linking form a third plus a third. And again, you can argue that that doesn't have a, oh, it's very easy to argue that it doesn't split in this way. There's nothing metabolic. There's nothing of self-linking zero. So it's got to be at least two-dimensional. So here's the first this new example. Again, it's, it's once you have this corollary, this isn't hard. If you take the figure eight knot plus a knot five one, you can see it doesn't bound a Klein bottle. And the proof is its linking form is two-fifths plus one-fifth. And now you have to work a little bit to see that that doesn't, there's nothing of self-linking zero. So there's no metabolic part. And then you have to do more algebra to see that this form doesn't have a two-by-two two integer matrix representative. And that's just some, uh, in this case, you can just do it by hand. It's a two-by-two two matrix, so you don't have to call on any theory. You just work a little bit to try to present it, and you run into number theoretic obstructions to present in this form. I want to mention one other result that follows from linking form, because this will reappear. I just put down, there's general theory here with P's and Q's, but I just put down one particular example. <coughs> if the two-fold cover of the knot has homology Z3 plus Z3 plus Z7, with this particular linking form, you can't show that it, it doesn't have a presentation of this sort. But if you play with the algebra a little bit, you discover that any matrix that presents that is going to be definite. And another way to say that is if you had a, if it did bound a Klein bottle, the two-fold branch cover of the four-ball ball over the Klein bottle would be a definite manifold. So we'll be coming back to this because the other techniques will feed into definite versus indefinite as well. So the second, that was linking form. We look at the use of signatures and ARF invariants. And so first I need to redo a little bit of four-manifold theory to see how these feed into genus problems. First result is 
in S4, if you have a closed surface, the signature of the twofold branch cover of the four ball branch over the surface is one half the self intersection number of F. And I need to say a word about this because if you just work in the orientable setting, self intersections are always zero if you're in the four sphere because it's homological. So just to tell you one way to define the self intersection of a non orientable surface is you isotope it to make it transverse to itself. And at each intersection point, you can orient the surface. You just pick a local orientation. The push-off then gets an orientation, and you can compute the intersection number. And then you check that that's independent of the choice of local orientation. So there is such a number. It turns out it's not hard to see um, that it's even, because you, you do have a Z2 self-intersection number, which is zero since the surface is zero in H2. And the proof of this result follows from G signature theorem. Other result is a generalization of Rockland's theorem for four manifolds. It says in this heading, the self-intersection of F plus twice something, which I'll define in a minute, is zero mod 16. Rockland's theorem in general says that the signature of a four manifold, in our case we're S4, so the signature is going to be zero, can be computed in terms of mod 16. The signature of a four manifold can be computed in terms of the self intersections of surfaces with some kind of adjustment. And the adjustment that you need in the non orientable setting was discovered by Google and Marin. So let me define those terms, because we need to understand that beta a little bit. Beta is called the Brown invariant. It takes values in Z8. And roughly what it does is, well, there's a quadratic form. If you have a surface in S4, there's a quadratic form defined on the Z2 homology. What the quadratic form is, is you take a curve on the surface, and you count how many half twists there are in the surface as you go around that curve. Now, this isn't defined in general four manifolds. There's no way to make sense of counting twists in general. But if you're in S4, or if you're in a general four manifold where the surface F is characteristic, then you can make sense of this. And then, given such a quadratic form, you can define beta of it, the Brown invariant, is you just sum the square root of minus 1 raised to q of x over all the elements in the homology. And it turns out, modulo correction factor, that's always an eighth root of unity. One example we'll be using. If the homology, if you have a Mobius band, and you compute the sum for non-singular z4 value form, what you get is, 1 plus or minus i. And that's roughly an eighth root of unity. And so that's how you go from surfaces in the four ball, surfaces in S4, to the C8 bound invariant. Um, C is a positive constant. C is the square root of 2 raised to the rank of the homology something like that. But there's some real number. You, when you do this, you, you see that you've got an eighth root of the limit. Square root of the number of elements in H1 So there are those two results again. So here are a couple corollaries. The first with Gordon Litherlin used the first of these two results to show that the signature of a knot could be computed using branch covers of non-orientable manifolds, and this was the formula. Um, it's not, once you have this theorem, this is not very hard. You can show that this is a well-defined knot invariant, and then you check that if you use an orientable surface, you get the standard signature. And the other result was an observation path made that the ARF invariant of the knot 
can also be determined using non-orientable surfaces in the uh, four ball, and it's given by this formula. And again, it's not hard to prove this once you have this result. It's just check that this is well defined, and then check that it agrees with the usual R invariant using the orientable surfaces. And a corollary of this is just doing some algebra with these two equations. You get that if you bound a surface F in the four ball, the signature plus four times the R invariant is given by the signature of the four manifold plus the Brown invariant of that surface. Again, one, one result that follows right away is that if you bound a Mobius band, then the signature of a knot in the ARF invariant satisfied this equality. And the proof, I don't think I wrote the proof down, but the proof is not hard at this point. If you bound a Mobius band, then the twofold cover of the four ball has homology Z. H2 is Z. So this is plus or minus 1. And since the form is so small, the surface is just a Mobius band, the Brown invariant is going to turn out to be plus or minus 1 also. And, and so it works out. So in particular, well, I think I did put up a couple of applications. Again, the figure 8 knot doesn't bound a Mobius band, because if you compute the signature plus 4 times the arc invariant, you get for mod 8. And also the granny knot, a similar calculation. So this formula, right away examples drop out from it. I want to look at, to get something new, I wanted to go back to the issue about definite and indefinite. And I had used the linking form to say that some knots, if they do bound a Klein bottle, it would necessarily be definite. And here, see the signature and the R invariant together can obstruct um, positive definite. Um, and again, this is just easy algebra. If you're positive definite, this would be 1 plus or minus 1, so you come out to be 0 over 2. More important to deal with Klein bottles you get some constraint. If a, if a knot bounds a Klein bottle and the cover is positive definite, you get some constraint on the R invariant in the signature. Well, alone, these are fairly, uh, it's only in conjunction with the other results that this will provide something. So. No, these, these, just G signatures there in Rockland's there. But they're, these are both top, oh no, they aren't topological there. They aren't topological, though. They depend on Rockland's there. So, just pointed out that using linking form R from variant and the signature all together, you can build examples where you rule out both not being if a knot bounds a surface, particular surface F, you can obstruct it being positive, definite, and indefinite. One example of this, I think. So if a knot bounds a Mobius band, and the linking form is A over P, and then the number theory you get into dealing with the form turns out to be that minus A should not be a square mod P then you know the manifold that MK bounds has to be negative definite. So now we're in a setting in which you can use Hager floor theory to, to obstruct negative definiteness. And in particular, what we found useful was the correction term that arises from Hager floor homology. The relevant theorem is that if you bound a negative definite manifold, I'm, I'm not going to define the correction term, 
But if you bound a negative definite manifold, and your boundary is a rational homology sphere, then you get constraints on first turn class of the spin C structure and the second Betty number of W. And the terms on the left are completely determined by the algebraic topology of the four manifold W. So these we can control algebraically, and this is a smooth invariant. So one consequence, this now permits you to rule out some negative definite, and we already could rule out positive and indefinite. So the first examples of this, where this is useful, is Kate Kearney has found examples of two bridge knots where H4, where, where they don't bound Mobius bands. And this is like, in terms of the table, this has permitted us to push on further and make some progress, at least against eight crossing knots, and should have further implications. And Pat and I could use this also. We don't know what knots these are, but if you start with the granny plus the knot 5-2, we can show that it doesn't bound a Klein bottle. And, no, I'm sorry. We can't show that it doesn't bound a Klein bottle. I don't know if we can show it doesn't bound a Klein bottle, but I do know that we can modify it by adding knots to it, and in doing so, you can force the correction term to become very negative, and thus rule out negative definite, where the signature in the linking form ruled out positive definite and indefinite. Now, adding knots of polynomial 1 doesn't change the topological concordance class. The polynomial 1 knots are topologically sliced. So all these knots are equivalent topologically, and it forms an infinite family of knots now that don't bound on models. And one other result is that it provides examples of knots that are that bound topologically they bound Mobius bands, but smoothly we know that they don't. So we found that distinction between the two categories. So kind of um, this Cass and Gordon invariants provide results that are kind of perpendicular to the ones I just mentioned. And so I want to do a little review of Cass and Gordon invariants, just at least define them to give a little sense of why they would tell something about what you can bound and what you don't bound. So the definition is you have a three-manifold and a map to ZP. And it's the case there always exists a four-manifold so that the character to ZP extends over H1 of W not quite true. You have to take a multiple of your three manifolds. So you take p copies of your three manifold, then there's a four manifold over which the character extends. And then this Cass and Gordon invariant, it's the most elementary to define of the Cass and Gordon invariant, is given by this formula where this is just the signature of W. W tilde is the p-fold cover of W, since you have a map of W to ZP, you get a p-fold covering space, and then you take, you want the signature of that covering space, that four-manifold, but you restrict to this eigenspace of the ZP action on the manifold. So the homology of the p-fold cover splits into pieces, the eigenspaces, and you just compute one eigenspace signature you subtract the signature of W, you divide by P, and you end up in Q. So that was the first Cass and Gordon invariant that was defined. It turns out it doesn't obstruct sliceness, but I'll come back to that. The term the Cass and Gordon proved using this invariant is, I just did it for a particular example, is that if you have a knot whose cover is the lens space LP squared Q, where P is a prime right now, and K is ribbon. That means it bounds a disk in the four ball that has no local minima with respect to the radial function. A different condition in terms of being ribbon is that just the map of the knot complement to the disk complement should be surjective. 
So with those conditions, then for any non-trivial character defined on the lens space, this invariant will be plus or minus 1. Should remark, everyone probably knows, it's a conjecture that this ribbon condition is no condition at all. It, it's conjecture that ribbon implies that you have the disk. There's the theorem again. I just want to run through the proof. <laughs> um, first step is that the homology of the branch cover of the four ball over a disk is rationally trivial. Because of this, you can argue that any character, that if the homology is zp squared, then you can argue that any character to Zp extends to W. So you don't have to work hard to find a four-manifold over which it extends. The, the branch cover over the disk provides you with a manifold. Computes. The first spinning number, well, M remembers a lens space. So it's covered by either a sphere or actually the p-fold cover of this lens space is another lens space, but there's no first Betty number. And by the ribbon condition, you see that the four-manifold has no first homology, rationally. And then you use the Euler characteristic to see that the four-manifold second Betty number is what it is, p minus 1. But that's just an Euler characteristic argument. And because of this, you have for the ZP action on W, you have P minus 1 eigenspaces. It turns out they're all the same dimension. So each eigenspace is one dimensional. And so that explains why you're going to end up with the one. So here are the, um, the results for the non-orientable genus that follows from this. And you'll see the result isn't quite, I'm going to have to have, instead of a four there, the word ribbon. And the result is, if you have a knot whose two-fold branch covers a lens space LPQ, and the knot bounds a ribbon surface, F, so again, a ribbon surface is one where there are no maxima, according to the height function, the radial function, the four ball. Then the first Betty number of the surface is bounded below by some multiple of m, where this constant depends only on Cassin-Gordon endurance of LPQ. And then in certain cases, we can prove alpha is positive. And in those cases, you see that the um, you get this result. That by taking large multiples of the knot, you get knots whose non-orientable genus goes to infinity. The proof is much the same as the Cassin Gordon result. The, the cover of the four ball has no first homology rationally. And if that homology, I'm sorry, if F is a small surface, then you get that some characters extend. In Cass and Gordon theory, you discover that all characters of a certain sort extend. The fact that you have some homology here is constraining, but you can find that some characters extend to the four manifold. So you can use the four manifold to compute Cass and Gordon invariants. The Two-fold cover of n times k. The two-fold cover of n times k is a connect sum of lens spaces. We're assuming the knot is covered by lens space. So the two-fold cover is a connect sum of lens spaces. And given that, if you take another covering space, you're going to have some first Betty number now, but you can control how much you have. So you have some understanding of the first Betty number of the cover. And so again, using Euler characteristic argument, you have some control over the second Betty number of this iterated cover. But now the control is getting very weak, but you do get some 
bounds. And so, of course, that now bounds sigma. But sigma is additive under connected sums. And so we can compute sigma in terms of just the castle gordon invariance of lens spaces. And so we have both these estimates and we have exact values and that provides the bounds. And in the best situations, you, you get, I'll put up a couple examples. There's the theorem. The first example is if you take the six twisted double of the unknot, then if you take n copies of that, the genus, the non-orientable genus is greater than n over 2. And I picked that knot because it was the first example of a knot in which all the algebraic invariants vanish, but it isn't sliced. So Cass and Gordon use this to show that algebraically sliced doesn't imply topologically sliced. And here we see that the, oh, and it had been shown that this knot, the four genus of multiples of it goes to infinity already. So here we were finally able to do the non-oriental genus. And I put up one other example just because part of it looks better. That if you take the 42 twisted double of the unknot, then you actually have that the non-orientable genus restricting to ribbon surfaces is greater than M. And that's roughly the best we can do in terms of um, the multiple of M that you get as a problem. So to finish up, I just want to mention a few of the problems that remain. One is just working examples. I, I think this is interesting just to identify where the problems are that we're still, as I mentioned, eight crossings looks maybe conceivable, but 